Matthew 5, verse 6. We're going to just hop right into the Word of God. How many of you love the Word of God? Okay. I love the Bible. I love how, I love how constant the Bible is. I'm so grateful, genuinely, my heart, that the Bible says the same thing every day. You take that for granted that we have truth in an age where people want to, you know, tell me your truth. <laughs> your truth doesn't matter. I want the word of God. Tell me the word of God. Find friends that will surround you and tell you the word of God, not their opinion. Hey, can I get your opinion on something? People ask me that. No, I'm not going to give you my opinion. My opinion's useless. I'm going to give you the word of God. We need the word of God. Amen? Come on. Just a few little things off the top of my heart. We need the word of God. Number two, <laughs> it does not go without saying. I've just been on a rant lately. People all the time, they say, well, it goes without saying. No, it doesn't. You need to say it. You need to open your mouth and say it. In relationship, as a leader, as a follower, you need to communicate. Can you imagine at the beginning of time, God's like, you know, he whispers to the angel, creation, it'll go without saying. It'll go, watch this. And they're like, well, they're waiting. He had to say, light, and there was light. So when you, when you are in a relationship, you're in a company, you're in a church, you're, you're in a family, you have to communicate what it is that you want, your desires, texting it doesn't count. It just doesn't count. Call somebody, say it to their face. Well, I texted you. No, call me. Say it to my face. It does not go without saying. Amen? I just want to save you guys some, some trouble in this day um, because a lot of, a lot of us, we, we get used to cultural things that are just not, they're not healthy for us, and they cause us a lot of problems. Amen? All right. Matthew 5, 6. Um, this is uh, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. So there we go. Just hit it with some tongues. Matthew 5, verse 6. Watch this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. There is a blessing available tonight for those of you who are hungry for the righteousness of God, which is in Christ. There's a blessing. And that blessing is this. It's the satisfaction of having been made right with God. I'm going to tell you from the get-go what I want to tell you tonight. The main point is there is nothing that can satisfy your heart like being made right with God. Nothing. No amount of money can satisfy you. No relationship can satisfy you. No opportunity or business venture or dream fulfilled can satisfy you. The only thing that can truly satisfy your heart is when you know, not when you kind of like maybe, I don't know, but when you know, when you know that 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 you are right with God. If you are right with God, it means that you are not wrong with God. Think about that. If you're right with him, it means that there's nothing wrong with you, with him. And if there's nothing wrong with you with him, and everything's right with you with him, then there's something called confidence in your heart. There's something called an open heavens over your life. There's something called rivers of living water that flow over you. Why? Because there's nothing hindering the flow of God's love, that, which is perfect, flowing to you. Nothing. However, many of us, we live with a defiled conscience. We don't actually believe that we are right with God. We are obsessed with looking at ourselves. We are obsessed with evaluating ourselves. We are like PhD expert doctorates in analyzing ourselves and how we think we're doing with God. 
Well, I've got news for you tonight. You don't have a clue how you are with God unless your clue comes from God. What you think about how you are with God means nothing if it's different than what God thinks that you are with him. When you gave your life to Christ, the Bible says that you were purchased by the blood of Jesus. It says in Corinthians, you were bought with a, you are not your, hmm. Some of you, if you just, if you just went through the door of that verse and, exp- and just let it be true for your life, you'd get delivered right now. You are not your own. Do you know how liberating that is? The reason why, if you're miserable, and I'm not assuming you're miserable, some of you look kind of happy <laughs> and free, and that's nice. You stay that way. But some of you struggle, some of you wrestle, some of you are in a, at a fight, you're in a grind, you're, you're, you're grinding, you're, you're, you're in that, like, that death march of like trying, and you're just, and you're in that struggle, and God's desire for you is to come up out of it. Not not that your circumstances in your life will be perfect. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you'll have an awareness that you're right with God so that you can actually overcome the trials in your life. God designed you to reign in life. He designed you to overcome that which came your way. This is why when you look at the early church, they were facing much bigger problems than you and I are facing. And the early church was winning. Some of you are like, ah, winning. Yes. When Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel and he starts singing and chains start busting off, that's winning. That's winning. That, he won that one. Sorry, the jail lost, he won. How did he win? Just hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Earthquake, free. <laughs> you think he gets stoned to death in Lystra? Stoned to death. They drag him out of the city, supposing he's dead. And the disciples gathered around him, and I think they raised him from the dead. Paul wakes up, and he's like, you think this man's about to take a year-long sabbatical because he just got stoned to death on the field. (laughs) That's what I think. I'm reading the narrative. I'm like, wow, he's about to just call into the board and write a letter, and guys, the ground is hard. I need a sabbatical. (laughs) No one would fault anyone here. You know, we went somewhere overseas and we got stoned and someone raised us from the deck. Bring him home. Let him have six weeks in Dallas. Put him at the four four seasons. Just let him relax a little bit. He needs to refresh and recoup. It's traumatic out there on the field. (laughs) I'm not wrong, am I? Paul gets lifted up. Yes, okay. Wakes up from the dead. Puts his big boy pants on in Jesus' name. And he says, I'm going to go to the next town. I must preach the gospel there also. And he testifies to them that that you will go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. With a smile on his face. Why? Because you couldn't kill a man who was already dead. That man, that man was satisfied with righteousness. He wasn't getting his identity from preaching the gospel. He knew his papa, and he was living. He didn't, well, I can't believe they hated me. The, the people in Lystra, they don't like me. They didn't receive me, God. He just, he just man of God, right with God, not questioning anything, just right with God. And today, listen to me. I've been hearing this reverberate in my spirit, this Jeremiah 12. I, I hear it from the Father. It's like a... It's like a beckoning cry. He says, he says, Jeremiah, he says, if you've raced with men on foot and they've wearied you, if you've, if you've run with men on foot and they've wearied you, how will you compete with horses? If in a safe land you've been so trusting, how will you fare in the thicket of the Jordan? What's he saying? He's saying it's your destiny to run with horses. He says, if, if, if 2020 wore you out, if politicians wear you out, If, oh, I can't believe they're doing this and that, wears you out. How will you run with horses? How will he entrust us true persecution? You realize we're not being persecuted right now. We are not being persecuted. 
I have some friends overseas. They're being persecuted. Their lives are at stake. Their real life. Being a Christian is dangerous. I had lunch with one last week. Heard from this man. He cannot say what he does, where he lives. Otherwise, he will die. He will die. He will literally, there will people, they will kill him. For doing, for just being what you and I get to be freely. <laughs> we get to be there freely. And I, I'm not mad. I'm, I feel an invitation from our Father to grow up, to be strengthened in the faith, to be prepared for the days to come, knowing that Jesus is coming and we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready for him. What does it mean to be ready? It means that we're abiding in him. We're waiting for and hastening the day of the Lord, standing in righteousness. And I'm concerned right now for how easily many of us are tossed off course by just little things. Small, minuscule things are setting people off of, off of the course of standing in the righteousness of God. Because our eyes are on other things other than him. And I don't think we're truly satisfied in him. I think there's greater realms of satisfaction that are available to us. And I believe with all my heart, and this is biblical, is found in the righteousness of Christ. When you're truly satisfied, now look at me. When you're satisfied, all of a sudden the temptations of sin are no longer, they don't have a, they don't have a grip. They knock and you're just sprawled out on your couch with your feet up with the socks and your belt unbuckled, because why? You're satisfied. You don't need to get up anymore and answer every door wondering who is it? What is it gonna offer me? You don't care anymore, why? Because you are satisfied. You're satisfied. Now how, how, can, you, how can you obey this truth? Because Peter says, it says, brothers and sisters, having obeyed the truth, having obeyed the truth, having purified your souls by an obedience to the truth. There's something that happens when you obey truth. What does that mean? That's a funny phrase, and it occurs a lot in the scriptures. Obey truth. It means that there is a truth presented to you in the gospel that you have to submit your heart to, meaning you, you have to be aware of what do I believe that resists and contradicts that truth. And then you have to bury it, you have to throw it away, you have to get rid of it. That's what it looks like to obey the truth. Let me, let me give you a real easy layup one. And if you do this, well, most many of us will end up in the fetal position on the floor just crying. God loves you. That's true. How do you know? We sang about it for an hour. The atonement, the cross. That is the revelation of the love of God. You, you cannot, look at me, you cannot change God's mind about what he did 2,000 years ago. That atonement happened. He made a decision of his own heart, his own volition, to so love the world that he would give his son. He can't undo that, he can't pull it back. But many of you came in tonight, and watch this, you actually believed, knowingly or unknowingly, that God wasn't fully in love with you tonight. Why, why did you believe that? Because of something going on in your life that you're aware that may or may not Maybe it's something that you have going on that, doesn't, that you know doesn't please God. It could be a sin habit, a sin pattern, maybe something you said, something you did. And what happens is we exalt that sin above what he did 2,000 years ago. We unknowingly withdraw from the presence of God. We sing melodies for an hour, but we keep our heart far. And obedience to the truth looks like this. If you're aware of sin, if the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, because that's his job, he will convict you of sin. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Don't be afraid of conviction of sin, because then you can repent. And you say, Father, I don't want that. And he says, I know. Let me help you. Let me love you. Let me love you in your mess. And he speaks to you things like, hey, did you know that I delight to show you mercy? We think God begrudgingly shows us mercy, and yet the word of God says he delights in showing us mercy. It actually gives him delight to be merciful to you. 
Do you see how when you begin in your heart to obey the truth, you have to let go, throw away, dismantle the unbelief in your heart? And you have to be honest. How would I be if I really believed that God loved me? You, you might smile. <laughs> you know why? Because when you believe that he loves you, you see his smile over you. And you can't help but smile when God is smiling. You can't. You can't look at someone doing this at you and you'd be like, I do it with my kids all the time. They're grumpy. They're like, mm. and I'm like, come on. They're like, and they can't, mm. and they just, ah, <laughs> you know? This is true of, of the Father. How bright is his smile? How satisfying is the smile of our Father over our lives? Why am I, why am I taking time here? I'm taking time here because when he's smiling over you, you can withstand all of a sudden, all of your triggers, they just, they disappear. You stop getting triggered. Some of us are so easily offended because you're not satisfied with his smile. It's, it's proof how little satisfaction we live in when we allow small things to trigger us or to knock us off that place of confidence with God. Another litmus test that we're not satisfied is comparison. You can't celebrate someone else's anointing. You can't actually celebrate someone else's joy. This is a huge one. Watch this. This is not in my notes. <laughs> Y'all are like, we know. We can tell. This is in Psalms. Sometimes you just have to go there. I've shared this before, but I love Bob Ross. <laughs> I relate to Bob Ross. He's got way cooler hair. Um, but he uses the same colors every time. Alizarin crimson, phthalo blue. <laughs> the same colors. And yet, and yet he paints something different every time. And I feel that way when I get up here. I'm like, the Lord, I'm like, okay, Lord, what colors we got? He's like, yes, yeah, the same ones. I like, got the same. It's the gospel. It's the everlasting gospel of Jesus. And somehow, and somehow, it's always like, oh, the gospel is amazing. I never get tired of seeing those little trees that he just, how did he do that? How does he blend it in? I don't know. How does God do that with this many people? How does he just speak to every one of us knowing exactly what we need and going, wow, God's amazing. How does God do it? I don't know. Look at this. Psalm 34. I didn't even tell y'all where to go. <laughs> where are the prophets? Y'all like, we knew. We knew. <laughs> yeah, okay. You kind of, okay. Look at this. Look at this. This is, we're getting after comparison, satisfaction, comparison. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul, said David, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Watch this. Let the humble hear and be glad. See, only the humble can hear someone else boasting in God and get happy. <laughs> Pride has taken root when we see someone else enjoying God and we're like, I don't know about that. <laughs> I want to see someone drunk in God and go, man, I want to have whatever Lori's drinking. I want what Lori's drinking. I'm going to have Father. I would like some of that. Whatever she sees, I would like. This woman just sits here and cries and laughs the whole time. Some of you are like, who is crying and laughing? It's Lori. Her name is Lori. You can come talk to her and you, you can ask her, you're like, what do you see? What do you feel? This would be the, the, you know, it does not go without saying. You can talk to her. She's a human. She's amazing. Come on. Let the humble hear someone boasting in God and be glad. See, you got to be right with God to do that. If you're not right with God, you're like, whoa, what are they doing? And, ah, and there's comparison and all this weirdness. I love it when super anointed people are around me. You know why? Because they're on the same team. We're on the same team. 
<laughs> it's awesome. I love that I don't have to be everyone else. I get to just be me. I like that. I like me. I like me. And I like Phil. And I like Melissa. I like Sly. I like Emily. I like Trace. I like Donna. I like, I like this whole role. I like all of y'all. I like more of you, but I don't know all of you as much to say that. Think about how free you would be if you could just be happy being you. And the boundary lines, look, the boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. You know what my boundary lines are? It's this frame that you see, it's called Peter K. Lewis. These are my boundary lines, and I'm happy being me. You know why? Because God made his home in me. He put his Holy Spirit in here. He said, that's prime real estate for the Holy Ghost. This is my boundary lines. Guess what? I don't have to step outside of me because I'm inside of me and I like me. Imagine you got happy in you, satisfied. That was enough. This is, your, this is the invitation for you tonight to break off this comparison weird what do they think of me? It doesn't matter what they think of you. You know why? Because you're right with God. Think about that. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the creator of the universe. He looks at you and goes, you're right with me. Doesn't matter if I'm wrong with you. I'm right with him. I'm not going to purposely try to be wrong with you. <laughs> but I'm right with God. And no one can take that from me. You know why? Because it didn't come from me, didn't come from you. It came from Jesus Christ. Look at this, the one person boasting in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then David does a corporate call to worship. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. This is true worship leading. The worship movement will grow when the people of God embrace humility and allow one person's breakthrough to become everyone's breakthrough. Oh, y'all don't wanna hear that. See, one person, one person worshiping God is enough for a worship movement. If there's humility in the room, one person, I just need one person on the guitar singing to the Lord that's like making its boast, just boasting in God. And the humble will hear that and they go, ooh, I'm following him. Yep, I don't know what I came in with. I'm leaving it behind. I'm following this one. Why? Because I don't want to be in my flesh. I don't want to come here and be navel-gazing. I want to see someone looking at God, making his boast in God, and saying, why don't you come worship with me? All right. Proverbs 30. I'm going to preach the gospel to you out of Proverbs 30. Verse 15. I apologize. That was my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> oh I wish we had I wish we had just time together you know we never have enough time I know some of y'all are thinking about seven o'clock and what you're gonna eat but I'm thinking about what we're eating and the time I want to eat with you I want to fellowship with you around the Word of God Do y'all remember, I'm just gonna do this for the sake, just for a little breather. Do y'all remember Miss Carissa, that lady on YouTube that ate the Chick-fil-A? Do y'all remember her? Oh man, okay, never mind, never mind. She's so happy, go, go YouTube it. She's so happy with Chick-fil-A. She's so happy, she eats one French fry and she goes, I'm satisfied, I don't need to eat no more. Y'all remember that lady? She was so, oh man, go look it up, never mind, never mind. It won't land, different audience. Okay, look at this, look at this, Proverbs 30, verse 15. Verse 15, Solomon's crazy. <laughs> he crazy. Look at this sermon, look at this message. The leech, <laughs> you ever heard that in church? No, because it only <laughs> mentions one time the word leech. Here it is, leech in the Bible. I hate leeches, I hate ticks, and I hate leeches from the pit of hell. Those things suck your blood, they're nasty. The leech has two daughters, okay. <laughs> give and give. Now I'm gonna interpret this proverb to you allegorically. This is sin. Sin is the leech. Sin is the leech. 
If you have not dealt with sin in your life, it's sucking your blood. It's sucking, it's pulling from you. It's pulling life from you. Why? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So when a leech called sin is on you, it's sucking life out of you. That's what sin does. When you're messing around with pornography, when you're messing around with, with lying and, and profanity and, and all the manner of things that we know, it's, it's a leech called sin. That can be unbelief is a sin. Unbelief is a sin. It sucks life out of you. Unbelief is perhaps one of the scariest sins because it inoculates you to the only thing that can save you, which is faith in Christ. Unbelief is, is should terrify you. I'm terrified of unbelief. More than any other sin, I'm terrified of it. It's scary. The moment you slip into unbelief, you now, you now are not believing the one thing that can save you from sin. So this leech... This sin has two daughters, give and give. And for many of us, you're living, the reason you're not satisfied is because you live under this demand. You're, 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 you feel this constant pull in your life. Give to me. Give me more. Give me more of your time. Give me more. Even we, we, we spiritualize it. We feel like we're not giving God enough. That's sin. Well, I'm just not giving God enough. That's sin, why? Because it's making you the center of the story. That's a man's gospel. That's a man-centered approach to God. Well, I just don't feel like I'm praying enough. I don't feel like I'm doing, stop. That's the leech talking. Give more, do more, give more, do more. That's not the gospel. <laughs> Fire of God's gonna just burn those suckers off. You know you gotta burn leeches off. You gotta burn ticks off because there's like this, this, this whole this hold on it you gotta the fire just the look at this three things are never look at this if you don't get this three things are never satisfied four never say enough look at this four things put the next one up 16 sheol that's death no matter how many things die i had a little bunny named carrie after the carrot you know carrot we just shortened it to carrie and that bunny died and guess what? Death didn't say, you know what? That's enough. Carrie died, and so nothing else needs to die. Guess what? Things kept dying. I had little pets that keep dying. My wife had a little bunny, Oreo, and he died. The dog ate it. Her dog. Yeah, I know. It's shocking. It's terrible. It's sad. Baby, I'm sorry if you're watching this. Pray for you. Extend your hand for Christy. <laughs> little Oreo. God rest his soul. But, but when Oreo died, death didn't say enough. Death didn't say enough. Death, death keeps claiming and keeps claiming and keeps claiming and keeps claiming. The barren womb. Many of you, if you struggled with infertility, you understand this struggle. My wife and I for three years struggled with that. And it was this feeling of it's, it, it's never, no amount of barrenness is ever enough. Do you see that kind of reverse? It's like it just keeps happening. Some of you feel that way spiritually. You feel like your life is barren. You feel like you're not producing anything. You're not, even in your business, you feel like, ah, it's just not working. I feel barren. The next one, the land never satisfied with water. This is land and earth that doesn't have any seed in it. When you pour water on dirt with no seed, the water just drinks it in, and there's never enough water. The, the, the earth never just says, you know what, that's enough, I'm good. It keeps taking it, and it drinks the water in continually, continually, continually. And the last one is the fire that never says enough. If you keep stoking a fire, it will burn continually. This was the priesthood. The fire was kept burning on the altar. It shall never go out. How does it not go out? It doesn't go out because there's fuel. It's never enough. The fire doesn't just burn. As long as there's fuel, it will burn forever. Think about that. And I want to tell you that these four, I believe, represent something in the gospel narrative. If the leech is sin, then only in Christ can those four things be satisfied. And I want to show you this because this, these four things in Jesus were satisfied. They were satisfied. I, no, hear me. They were satisfied. What Solomon said, it'll never be satisfied. In Christ, they're satisfied. 
And, and these four that I'm gonna show you, we're gonna close with this. This is righteousness. This is what is right for you and I. The first one, Sheol, death. Now this is really hard for us to understand and I'm not gonna pretend that in five minutes we're gonna all just radically understand the atonement perfectly. But when Jesus hung on that cross and he gave up his spirit, it was the greatest injustice ever. There has never been, there's a lot of injustice happening in the earth right now, a lot, that's worthy of our prayers and our attention and our actual action. <laughs> Amen? 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 Do justice. Do justice. Do justice. But this moment was the height forever of injustice. Another way of saying injustice is that's wrong. It was wrong that the spotless lamb of God should die at the hands of sinful men. Why? Because there was nothing, there was nothing in him that was deserving of death. Even Pilate said there's nothing in this man deserving of death. It would be wrong to kill him. It's wrong. However, so in our eyes, we look at the cross and we look at that through a lens and we say, that's wrong. Yes or no? Yet from heaven's eyes, it was right. Do you see how wrong we are? When you say that's wrong and it is wrong, heaven says that's right. This is how far off we were. Pure, spotless Lamb of God murdered at the hands of sinful men. You can't say if you're just a thoughtful person, an innocent person, we, we, we decry when someone innocent dies, do we not? How much more the Lamb of God? How pure, how spotless, how innocent? And we go, that's wrong. And heaven goes, that's right. So automatically, in this moment, we realize we are on opposite ends of the spectrum of understanding of right and wrong. So you cannot begin to take a baby step in understanding the righteousness of God in Christ without first looking at the thing that we call wrong, he says, that's right. Why was it right? It was right for love because God is love. And in only way that God who is love could be one with people who had been marred by sin was to take on their sin, to take on the penalty on their behalf. So through the eyes of love, the cross was right. The Father goes, this is right. And in his death, he satisfies death. In his death, he satisfied the wages of sin, which is death. So in Christ, for those who put their faith in him and will allow Christ's death to become their own, all of a sudden now death is satisfied. That's step one to being satisfied. I don't need to eat no more. That's step number one. Because if you don't first deal with the fear of death, Hebrews chapter two, you will be a lifelong slave to the fear of death, is what the Bible says. But through death, he destroyed the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, why? So that we could be free from the fear of death. Now when you're free of the fear of death, there's a satisfaction that comes over you that's nice. I remember when ISIS, uh, when they were, they were cutting the people's heads off with the, the Coptic Christians in Egypt. And I remember I watched that on, the, on CNN or Fox, whatever it was, and I, they, were sh they were like showing the, with the orange and they were leading them. And I went for this run and I remember feeling afraid. The spirit of fear came over me. And I was like, this is not Bible times, this is today. They're killing, I'm like, I'm a Christian. If I was there, that could be me. And I'm, I went for a run, I like to run, just think and pray. And the Lord was like, really father? I'm like, God, you need to father me because I feel afraid. And he says, he says, what's gonna happen? 
if they did that to you? What would happen? What do you think would happen? I would be with you. So you're gonna be afraid if someone threatens you with me? <laughs> well, when you put it that way. <laughs> no, do you see? <laughs> you can't threaten a Christian with God. If I die, I'm with him. That's what it means to have the fear of death broken off of you. You're aware of where you're going because you're aware of someone who has conquered death. And it's not, he's not an ethereal pie in the thigh sky theology. He's a man who conquered death, who lives inside of me. So something inside of me, it testifies, oh, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> Hebrews 9 says this, and just as it is appointed for man to die Oh, come on, read your Bible. Je Hebrews 9. Just as it is appointed for man to die, and after that comes judgment, so Christ will come a second time, not in reference to sin. What? So Christ comes a second time, not in reference to sin, but to save those eagerly waiting for him. What do you mean you're not coming a second time in reference to sin? He goes, I dealt with sin on the cross. And it's appointed for man, watch this, oh, watch this, it's appointed for man to die once. One time. One time. So when you put your faith in Jesus' death and you get to say, I have been crucified with Christ, I have been buried with Christ, and I have died once. And after that comes judgment. What's your judgment if you've been, cru oh, watch this, oh my, 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 my. If you and your nasty, sinful self has been crucified with Christ, buried with him, and you got resurrected with the resurrected Christ to newness of life, the Bible says there's a judgment. Why? Because you died once. No, after you die, there's a judgment. So you die, you get resurrected, and God, he inspects you. He's like, all right, I gotta release a judgment over this one, because you died once. And he looks at them, and he looks at you, and remember, all your nasty sin was crucified with Jesus, buried in a grave, and you were resurrected with Christ in newness of life. And so he looks at you, and he's expecting you. He goes, I'm gonna give you a verdict over your life, a judgment. This is my judgment. Righteous. Not, no. Not, he's not, he's not like, let me look past your sin and your brokenness. He's saying, you are righteous, you are right. Why? Because all of your nastiness, all of your sin, I have dealt with on the cross. Now it's high time we get him on board with God. You, you do God no favors to embrace a sinful identity that he crucified 2,000 years ago. You're not helping God. That's not humility. It's not humility, it's pride to hang on to something that he crucified 2,000 years ago. It's spiritual pride, and I know that sounds strong, but it's real. 2 Corinthians 5.21, you can put it up. <laughs> he, for our sake, whose sake? For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, everyone say in him. Amen. I don't know how you get more satisfied than in him. In him, we might become the what? When you find yourself in him, enjoying the righteousness of God, you're no longer for sale. There's no opportunity, no open door, no money that could ever, you, you have arrived. When you're in him, you've arrived. I'm telling you, the young ones, the old, it doesn't matter. If you can find yourself in him, I promise, and I'm telling you from experience, I have had the privilege of experiencing amazing things in God. Conferences and wonders and like just things that you'd be like, wow, you're so blessed. Did it satisfy you? No, it didn't. You know what satisfies me? When I get in my 2007 Forerunner and I sit in and I'm like, oh, my brakes are shot. And I sit in there and I know that God loves me and I'm right with God and I'm sitting there and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm a son. I'm a son. I'm in Jesus. Well, what's in your bank? It doesn't matter. 
what's your five-year plan? I don't know, but I know that I'm gonna be in him this year and next year and the year after that and the year after that. That's my five-year plan is to be in him. <laughs> you can't take me out of in him. Now look at this, this is a gift. Watch this, we're gonna end this way. This is a gift. And one time I was, I was realizing, you know, cause I, I was taught that God, he makes us righteous so that he can see us and love us. God makes us righteous so that he can love us. I was taught that, or I, I learned that somewhere. You ever heard that? Like he makes you righteous so he can love you. And he just challenged me, so he goes, what? <laughs> He goes, while you were a sinner, I demonstrated my love for you. He goes, I didn't, the gift of righteousness isn't for God. He says, I don't give gifts like you do. Uh-oh. Y'all know, y'all know the people, they give you a gift, did you like it? They didn't give that to you for you, they gave it to you for them. You know the people that give you a gift, did you like it? And they never, they didn't say thank you. Well, why'd you give them the gift? Was it for you or for them? God doesn't give gifts that way. God gives gifts freely to us for us. I said, well, then what did you, why did you give us righteousness? He says, because you're constantly trying to judge yourself unworthy of my love. You constantly try to put yourself out of my love, so I gave you a gift so that you would never do that again. So that, watch this, every time you're tempted to judge yourself, you look and you go, right. I just feel wrong, right. Why, because you received a gift. And it comes from Christ, it comes from his work. So what do you do with your brokenness? What do you do with stuff that you're walking out? You come close to your papa in righteousness and you go, dad, help. You don't, you don't hide from God because you're in a sin struggle you draw even closer. You come to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace in your time of need. Because I can hear some of your thoughts, well then what do I do with my brokenness? You come face to face with your papa, robed in righteousness, because your righteousness, your access, isn't connected to your behavior, it's connected to Christ. This doesn't automatically abscond your behavior from just being you're not gonna be judged. It means that you now have access to grace and power to overcome your sin habits, to be free. Because it's for freedom that he sets you free. Make no mistake about it, when you receive the gift of righteousness, people are get so worried, like that's gonna give a licentiousness to sin. People are gonna just start sinning. <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about. You've clearly not experienced the grace of God nor righteousness. People that talk that way, it's a theology to them. They've not experienced being face to face with God in righteousness, in brokenness, needing savior, needing help, needing, needing affection in your weakest moment. And we need this because this is a narrow road. There are many people right now trying to, to like, just weird doctrines and theologies saying that you can have access to God and his presence some other kind of way other than the righteousness of Christ. In Paul's day, it was no different. He's like, if I'm still preaching circumcision, because back then with the Jews, it was circumcision. You're like, wow. It was. That was the sign of righteousness. What, what, is, what does that mean? It was an outward display of righteousness in the flesh. And if you didn't have that outward display of righteousness in your flesh, you could not be right with God. That's what they were saying. And Paul goes, man, if I'm still preaching that, he goes, why? I, I, will, I would have removed the offense of the cross. What's the offense of the cross? It's that you cannot get the presence of God outside of the cross. No man can earn it, no man can attain to it, why? No man can boast that look what I did, look at my anointing, look at the ladder that I climbed. No, you climbed nothing. Jesus Christ opened a new and living way and the only people that are walking in true power, true anointing, they received it from heaven. This is what John said, no man can, can he can, whatever, I forget what it says. You guys know the scripture. I hope you know it. It's in John three, I can see it right there, two, three, four. Danny, you gotta help me, bro. I mean, I needed you like five minutes ago. I'm just kidding.
We need faith to believe this. <laughs> it's hard for us to believe. But there is a gift, I believe, available to all tonight. Some of you say, well, I've received that. I, I know. But there's an experience of it that's the fuel to prayer, that's the fuel to every one of the spiritual disciplines you feel like you're struggling with. I'm telling you, when you know you're right with God, you become ravenous for the word of God, for prayer. You know, you become so aware of the presence of God, I can testify in my own life. I am, I am a recovering workaholic for God. I know this, I have tried to make myself right before God through doing all the right things and it didn't work until I discovered the good news of Jesus, the gospel. And then I got, I just, I just started living intoxicated on God. I, you know what I did? I stopped counting my prayer hours. I remember when the Lord very clearly, I was like discouraged about how much I was praying. <laughs> how much I was praying. And the Father interrupted me, he said, my wife's name is Christy, by the way. He said, how much time have you spent with Christy this week? I was like, that's a strange question, Father. I don't know. He goes, well, I mean, how many hours have you spent with her? I'm like, you mean like one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, or like if we're in the kitchen cooking together, does that count? Sleeping in the same bed, does that count? Because that's eight hours, that's, you know, I'm, this is a lot, I'm doing some big math here. He said, why are you counting your hours with me? Why are you counting your hours with me? How weird is that? Can you imagine in a marriage relationship, the couple knew, they're like, yeah, we've spent 14.5 hours this week together. What? You did what? Why are you counting? Hear me, why are you counting? Stop counting and enjoy your father. He's present every day, every moment. If his eye is on the sparrow, how much more is it on you? Live under his countenance, live with his friendship, live with his presence. He's not far from any one of you because Jesus made a way for us to be in him. And this is what it means to abide in Christ. What does abide mean? You just stay where God puts you. I'm, not, I'm real simple. Abide. If you abide in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Okay, what does that mean? Just stay where God put you. Okay, where did you put me, God? I put you in my son. Just don't move. And you're telling me this, God's going to produce much fruit? Yes, I am. And you know what's so nice about this? You, you stop assessing yourself by everyone else, by some standard and you actually start enjoying God. God is enjoyable. He's the smartest, funniest, most encouraging. I mean, some of us, I feel like we haven't enjoyed the fact that we have this relational access with the living God. We have God as our Father. And I know for many, the, the, the concept of Father is, is obscured but the Holy Spirit will help you. Will help you relate to him as father. He's funny, he's kind, he's gentle. He understands weakness. He understands your soul where you're at. He understands your spouse more than you do. Oh my gosh, he's a ninja with spouses and marriages. He knows how to handle relationship issues. He knows how to handle unfair bosses. He knows how to handle circumstances in life that are really difficult. He's got something called wisdom that you and I need. And guess what? It comes from his mouth. You know, he knows how to parent. Where are my parents at? Raise your hand. Where are my parents at? He knows how to parent your kid. He knows what your kid needs. He will give you wisdom. I'm building faith. He will give you wisdom for your children because each of them need different things. And some of you feel right now, you feel like I don't have enough time for them. And he'll show you how to find time, how to buy time. I have five children. I have right now 33 people that have said they're gonna run with me and my wife and my kids 
for 15 weeks, a team of nine people. I've got people and I prayed, I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing with my kids. I got, they all need my time, every single one of them, they're awesome. And he just showed me little, he gave me little keys, little secrets to unlock their hearts. He's awesome. I'm not smart. I don't have anything but God does. And this is the satisfaction of righteousness. We stop counting, we, stop, we start living in the new covenant. We start living in friendship with God. And that's what's available tonight. That's what's at stake. So I just wanna pray for you. We're gonna just stay in this place for a little bit. I hope your faith has been stirred, quickened. There's a better way. I trust that everyone here longs, I'm myself included. I just want deeper friendship with him through righteousness. It's Psalm 17. Verse 15, you can put it up there. This is it, this is my prayer. Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I don't know about you. I don't know about all y'all. But as for me, I shall behold your face, God, in righteousness. And when I wake up every morning, I will be satisfied with your likeness. Look at me, guys. We'll pray in a minute. But I want to bless each of you. I want to bless you. I want to bless that if there have been clouds darkening your vision of his face, I want to bless you that the clouds would part. That, that starting tonight, you would be able to see the face of your father in righteousness. That you would experience what it means to be right with God through Jesus. And you'd smile back at him. You'd let him love you and you just enjoy being right with God just for a few moments I know we're we're over time but I want to just take a few minutes and just literally enjoy there's nothing to do other than to enjoy to savor being right with God tonight and if you don't know if you don't really know that you're right with God you've never actually confessed Jesus as your Lord this would be a great time to just stand up and go I want to do that because I don't know that I've ever, I've ever done that. If that's you, if that's anyone here, just stand up, lift both your hands. We'll pray. We'll wait a minute. It's okay. Because you heard the gospel tonight. not standing before men you're standing before God if that's you it's a confession yeah it, it, it does feel scary you're confessing among 500 people I want to be right with God <laughs> anyone want to be brave rest of us let's just enjoy for a few moments don't be too contemplative in your own self I want you to see him if there's something you need to talk to him about if you need to confess sin if you need wisdom on something you can do that in a minute but just just enjoy being a son being a daughter
nothing to do but enjoy. Allow yourself to feel clean before God. Plead the blood of Jesus over your heart, your mind, your conscience, your body. Just feel what it feels like for a moment by faith to be completely clean before your Father by the blood of Jesus. No flaws. You have permission tonight to put your faith in him. It honors him. It actually honors his blood. It honors his work to feel clean. right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, in your presence is fullness of joy. There must be joy. (laughs) Make us glad tonight in your presence, not with any help of anything else, but just you, God. Just you. Come on, let him make your heart glad if you're willing. Let God make your heart glad. It's a sign of his presence. Because there's nothing left to do, because you're right. Let the humble hear. (laughs) Let the humble hear and be glad. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's not the fire burning the leeches off, it's the wine. It's the wine. It's the wine of his spirit. Just drink. Just drink. Just drink. They're not drunk like you might think they are. We like being free, Lord. We like it. (laughs) Our laughter is our worship. It's our gratitude for your blood. For some of you, it may just be a song in your heart of gratitude. It may just be a smile on your face. You may just be lifting your hands. <laughs> just respond to him in your own way. And let the humble hear and see and be glad. The people of God enjoying their God.
Some of you may just need to stand up and drink a little bit. Put your hand on your belly and just kind of move a little bit. If you feel stuck, I mean, that's fine. But if you don't, then just stay there and drink too. But if you're just feeling kind of... Come on, think back. You've been satisfied. Jesus, you satisfied Sheol, the barren womb, the land. Ha. Ha. <laughs> and the fire. <laughs> you satisfied it, Lord. Oh, the latter rain shall be greater than the former rain. Well, Lord, today is latter. We are in those latter days, and we thank you for the latter rain to wash away our pain. Thank you, Jesus. finish before we do you are welcome to leave God bless you be free there's no guilt shame condemnation you be free you're not less spiritual less holy you be free your father will go with you <laughs> for those of us we're gonna just remain a little bit and drink just for a, just for a few minutes more some of you need a drink so much pain, so much sorrow, so much sadness. It's a table in the presence of your enemies that God has set. There's a table set before you tonight with new wine, with bread, and with oil. Wine to gladden the heart of man, bread to strengthen your heart, and oil to make your face shine. Where's that oil?